Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to discuss in this module is trash, palimpsest, mudslides, and the littlest pyramid you've ever seen. We're going to look at exactly how sites form and what creates the archaeological record. We're going to follow the outline right up above, and that you should write that down, and that will serve as a guide for the notes that will to follow. And let's go ahead and get started. Why study the past? Why do archaeology? These are things we've already answered. One uses archaeology to study the past and uses archaeology to ask questions that history cannot answer. A successful archaeology, when it's done correctly, actually generates knowledge about the past. One studies the past because the past isn't always what we think it is. History or legend or myth might tell us one thing about, say, the Great Pyramids of Giza, archaeology is going to tell us what is most likely to have happened, as close to the truth as we can get. Because the past is kind of this, this undiscovered country, and the past can only be truly explored with archaeology. So that's why we do archaeology. That's why we study the past. The next step is to understand how you actually study the past. And the key to understanding how you study the past is how the archaeological record forms. So what we're going to talk about here is something called site formation processes. And site formation processes are defined right there. It is the, the set of cultural and natural events that combine to create the archaeological record, that combine to create the site. Now, what exactly is a site itself? A site is anything that is the focus of archaeological investigations. Uh, the, the site I work at is the ancient Maya city of El Peruaca, and that's, that's where these two photographs are taken from. Uh, that one is from structure M1415. The one right above my little yellow box uh, is structure N142. That's where we found the human sacrifice. Uh, but these are the sites I work at. A site is anything that is a focus. It doesn't have to be an ancient Native American city. A site can be a simple camp from 1970, where we're going next. It could be a Ice Age hunting camp. It could be nothing more than a bone scatter uh, produced by hunting or natural processes. A site I once excavated at, at uh, underneath the I-12 bridge in, in Louisiana, it was nothing but a huge pile of Pleistocene megafauna bones. You know, big, big mammoth and giant horse bones. They're very easy to excavate because they're freaking huge. Uh, but but a site can be anything. It doesn't have to be these. Doesn't have to be the Egyptian pyramids. It can be a simple camp from 1970. And at the site, you have to figure out exactly what happened at the site. And to do that, you have to figure out how the archaeological record was formed. And then the archaeological record is formed from discrete depositional events. So let me go ahead and explain this chart that's around us. Basically. Things happen in the past. Things happen, and each thing that happens is a depositional event. It's called a depositional event because each event leaves behind a deposit. It leaves behind a trace of itself on the landscape. And then on top of those traces, another depositional event takes place. And it in turn you create, leaves another layer, another layer of deposited material. And all together, these depositional events create the archaeological record. So in order to study the past, in order to study the archaeological record, what you have to do is piece together what happened in each of these in each of these depositional events. What happened to build the archaeological record? And once you have this sort of sequence of depositional events, then you can get at past human behavior, what these ancient people did in antiquity. And that is going to answer your research question, whatever your research question may be. Who built the pyramids? How did the Karankawa adapt to coastal Texas? What happened in Pompeii? Or what happened in the littlest pyramid you've ever seen? Uh, now, this is a little pyramid that we're going to deal with later. This is a pyramid that I excavated Oh, more than 10 years ago. This is, uh, it's got the incredibly uh, sexy name of M1312. It's a very small pyramid. It's only about seven meters tall. And when we actually get to the archaeological record of the Littlest Pyramid, uh, structure M1312, 
I'm going to give you all of the data and you guys are going to piece together the depositional events that created M1312. But before we get to this kind of, it's actually kind of a complex pyramid, but before we actually get to this complex pyramid and the tomb that was inside of it, let's take something much, much simpler. Let's start really small. Let's go back to the ancient past, to the year 1970. Because that's where I got this picture from. Uh, the picture right up above me is uh, from a, a tourist pamphlet uh, published to promote tourism in California. And it was published in 1970, which is probably about when this uh, photograph was taken. And uh, given that that woman's absolutely appalling shirt, uh, it's almost certainly 70s fashion. So it's, it's, it's definitely 1970s. So, uh, and this was taken at Thousand Island Lake, uh, which is uh, in the Ansel Adams Wilderness of Northern California. And I'm taking this photograph in particular because if we all got into a plane and if we flew uh, to the wilds of Northern California, uh, we could find that very distinct mountain in the picture. It's actually kind of a famous mountain. Ansel Adams is a photographer and he took a lot of long, uh, long time exposure images of these natural wonders, including that mountain. So anyway, I'm using this because we could find the shape of the lake shore. We could position ourselves so that we know exactly where that mountain is. And basically we could using this photograph almost certainly find the exact spot where this recreational camp from 1970 was from. And we could actually dig down into the earth and see what we could find. What would be the remains of this recreational camp from 1970? So look at what they've got. Well, look at what these guys have got. They've got a, that tent's way too small. They've got a tent. There's cookware. There's somebody cooking. There's a pair of guys hanging out. There's a guy that looks like he's going to go. There he is. He looks like he might go fishing. Think about what in this photograph would survive in the archaeological record for some 50 years. What in this photograph would be left from this recreational camp in 1970? So let's, let's, let's imagine we travel to the Ansel Adams wilderness. We find the lake shore of Thousand Island Lake and we excavate us. What from this recreational camp in 1970 would we actually find? And the answer is we'd probably find this stuff. All right, this is probably what we would find. You know, some aluminum beer cans, uh, that on the upper left, that's uh, an ashy lens. That's probably the remains of their fire, even though it would be buried. And you're going to find the circle of fire cracked rock that would surround um, their fire. Maybe there's a bent old spoon. Uh, there's some shell casings from a 22. Uh, that thing on the lower left, I sometimes actually have to explain to students what that is. That's a disposable pull tab because for, uh, for Coke and soda and beer in the 1960s and 70s and even into the 80s, uh, you didn't just sort of like crack, crack open the can. You actually had to crack it and pull the top uh, right off. And then you would just throw uh, the disposable pull tab off to the side where if you're very lucky, um, like a six or seven year old is gonna run along the beach and it will embed in their foot and, and cut them all to pieces. That was me, by the way, that happened in Biloxi Beach in like 1978. At any rate, uh, that's how they uh, used to, that's how they used to seal cans was through these disposable pull tabs. So my question here is, could we reconstruct the past human behavior uh, using only what they left behind? Because they're not gonna leave behind their really nice stuff. They're not gonna leave behind tent poles. They're not gonna leave behind the tent. They're not gonna leave behind the cooking pots. They're not gonna leave behind the fish hooks, uh, assuming that guy is going fishing. They're not gonna leave their little plinky 22 rifle they're gonna take all that stuff with them. They're only gonna leave behind their trash. They're only gonna leave behind their rubbish. Now, I don't know if you remember the 70s, I do. People used to litter like crazy in the 70s. They used to, throwing trash out of your car window was accepted practice in 1975. And so people littered with, with abandon. And so the question is, could we reconstruct just from their rubbish that this was a recreational camp deposited in 1970? And the answer is, I, th I think we pretty much could. Uh, 
we would know it's recreational from the beer, uh, from the little uh, 22. This is not a serious hunting rifle, not if you're going after anything bigger than a rabbit. Uh, we could probably find from the bent to discarded tools. We know this isn't a long-term camp. Uh, so our, our default position would be, you know, this is probably a recreational camp. They're not doing serious hunting. They're not doing serious fishing. They're drinking a lot of beer. They're being really, uh, they're being really bad with their trash discipline. Everything about Everything about that points to recreational campers. And we would pretty much know that these guys are in the 1970s based on the material evidence, based on, frankly, right here, the beer can. Um, all of those beer cans, uh, you know, the, the style of the label changes very, changes almost every year. The technology of the cans themselves change constantly. The amount of metal in the cans has consistently declined since 1950. Um, you don't. You wouldn't want to take one of these like '70s beer can and crush it on your forehead. You would just punch a beer can shaped hole in your skull. Um, so basically, from the logos on the on the beer cans, there's there's Schlitz beer, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. I don't even think people drink that crap anymore, or at least I hope they don't. Uh, and if you do, stop. At any rate. So we could pretty much very closely estimate 1970. Maybe the shell casings might have marks on them. They might even have serial numbers or a, a, a little stamp indicating place and time of manufacture. Such things aren't unknown. But basically, based on the rubbish, we would probably be able to reconstruct. This is a, the depositional event that left this material was a recreational camp from the shell casings, from the design of the beer cans and the logos and the cans themselves, we could probably come up with, oh, this is probably at or around 1970. I don't know if we could narrow it down to the exact year, but we could get very, very close. And this is actually probably a really good thing. One of the things about garbage, one of the things about rubbish is, uh, it's probably your best information doesn't come from, you know, these elaborate tombs. It doesn't come from this like really sexy archaeology that makes it into National Geographic. The best archaeology is the study of low value rubbish. And the joy and the beauty of data from trash is that garbage doesn't lie. You might go on a camping trip and then come back and your mother might say, did you guys drink? You might say, oh no, mom, we didn't drink at all. But your garbage, the garbage that you left out into the woods, that doesn't lie. And in fact, we're going to investigate this in an entire textbook, which is coming up next, which is William Rathke's Rubbish, The Archaeology of Garbage, which is the study of the rubbish from 20th and 21st century America. And this is the important thing about garbage. Garbage represents objective truth. Garbage doesn't lie. You might say, well, I don't drink very much. Your garbage will say whether how much you actually drink. You might say, I have a very, very healthy diet, but your garbage is going to be full of like fast food wrappers and pizza boxes. You might say, I'm not a Sicilian mobster, but your trash might be full of secret communications to mobsters in New York. That actually happened. And the guy that happened to was called Joe Bananas. And we'll meet Joe Bananas when we get uh, to William Rathke's book, but I don't want to spoil anything for now. So we're, we're still in California. We're still at the, on the shore of Thousand Island Lake. And we have found a recreational camp from 1970. That is just merely one depositional event that is making up the archaeological record. But the thing is, there might be multiple depositional events. And this is the type of thing that was studied by a very famous archaeologist named Lou Benford. And this is from Lou Benford's work on how archaeological sites form, how the archaeological record is formed. He studied uh, Inuit caribou hunters in northern Alaska, and he was studying how they deposited material in and around their hunting sites because he wanted to compare the behavior of modern hunters and be able to make an analogous model comparing them to Ice Age hunters either you know, in Ice Age America hunting buffalo or in Ice Age Europe hunting reindeer. So at the mask site, which is where he studied, he looked at how hunters actually dispose of trash, the behaviors they actually do while they're waiting for the caribou herds, and he came up with a sort of model hunting camp, the sort of idealized set of behaviors associated with hunting camps. Now, this is how 
uh, the hunting camp works. The herds of caribou, which are these like really big reindeer looking things, uh, they live in uh, like the northern parts of North America. Uh, the caribou herds move in set patterns throughout the year. And in this part of Alaska, uh, the caribou spend the summer in southern Alaska or central Alaska. And then in the winter, they'll move north uh, as, as sort of northern Alaska sort of unfreezes. So the caribou move around Alaska in these very set patterns. And uh, in the sort of early spring, the Inuit hunters there, people we used to call Eskimo, uh, know about the time of year where the caribou are going to come through. So they'll basically pitch their hunting camp on the lee side of a hill where the caribou can't see them. Take the youngest member of their hunting party, which is usually a, a, like an adolescent boy, like a teenager, and he gets to sit out in the cold on the top of the hill. Uh, if they've got a binoculars or a spyglass, they give it to him. But most often he just sits up there in the cold. And it's his job to look uh, for the caribou uh, while the actual hunters, the men themselves, sit around a fire. So they're going to build this hunting camp and they're going to sit there. They can sit there for up to, up, up to a week at a, at a time, waiting for uh, the boy to tell them that the caribou have showed up. And then they're going to get out, get their rifles and go hunt. And then they're going to, when they bag a bunch of caribou, then they'll come back and then abandon their, their camp. But here's where the rubbish from that camp is going to go. And it basically, Lou Benford basically figured out that the size of the rubbish determines where it goes. If it's a really small piece of rubbish, like a cigarette butt or a magazine or a piece of paper or a pull tab, the really small pieces of trash go right into the fire. They just throw them right in there. They finish smoking their cigarette and then flick their butt straight into the fire. Sort of smallish pieces of rubbish, you know, like smaller little bits of bone, small little bits of dinner, those things are going to get dropped at your feet and you're going to kind of scuff it over with your foot. So sort of really small stuff goes in the fire, kind of smallish to medium sized pieces of trash go right at your feet. As long as you don't throw your trash, at, you know, in your buddy's lap, it's okay. The bigger pieces of trash though, sort of the big bones or sort of a half new, half chewed chicken leg or a pork chop bone. Once it's done, you, once you're done gnawing it, Lou Benford noted that that piece of rubbish goes right over the shoulder. Thus, there is a patterned set of disposal methods for rubbish attached to this Inuit hunting camp. You've got the fireplace, you've got the drop zone, and then for your large pieces of rubbish that go over the shoulder, that is the toss zone. And indeed, he noted that these camps are never in perfect circles uh, because they're on the side of a hill. Um, they're always sort of U-shaped. And I want, well, I'm not going to tell you, you can study uh, the model seating plan here and kind of cogitate for a second. Why aren't they sitting in a perfect circle around the fire? The answer, of course, uh, should be really apparent. And again, uh, Benford's goal was to produce an analogy to Ice Age hunters in either Europe, Asia, or in North America, comparing modern behavior and modern disposal techniques to ancient behavior and ancient disposal techniques, looking at the low value rubbish that these different depositional events are going to play, going to place on a landscape that they're going to leave behind on a landscape. Now we're going to leave his model seating pattern and return to the mask site, which is, as you can tell, four different hunting camps with the numbers of years between each camp placed on the same hillside over a long period of time. And each depositional event is going to deposit its rubbish, is going to deposit its material on top of material from previous camps, on top of previous depositional events. And taken, taken together, this is what's known as, or this is what I call, the palimpsest effect. Now here's the definition of the palimpsest effect. The palimpsest effect is the discrete layering of material from different depositional episodes that together make up the archaeological record. And it's named after ancient medieval palimpsests. That's a palimpsest right there in the lower left. A palimpsest is a medieval book. And what they would do in the Middle Ages is vellum was uh, very valuable. So basically when they, when they had a book that nobody wanted or a book they had an extra copy of or a book that just contained like trivia, like or tax receipts or something, 
what they would do is take the vellum of the book, wash it, take a razor blade and scrape away as much ink as they could. And once the old ink was kind of faded, they could then rotate the book 90 degrees and add in uh, a new book, right? A new line of text directly on top of it. So each book in a palimpsest, which could contain three or four, even five different books written one on top of the other, each book, each text is a depositional event. And it's sort of overriding what was previously there. Now here's what an actual palimpsest looks like. As you can tell, this has got, I think there's at least three different texts here, three different handwritings for when they scrape the pages and reuse the vellum in the book several times. And this is a palimpsest. And there, there's an analogy between these medieval palimpsests and the archeological record. So a palimpsest effect is the discrete layering of depositional events each one layered on top of its previous, on top of its predecessor, overriding what was previously there. So just like you saw that palimpsest in the previous picture, here we have the mask site, where we have four different depositional events. It's the same depositional event. They're all caribou hunting camps. And you can see each time the Inuit reused this uh, hunting site, they sort of, the depositional event they created overwrote and layered on top of what was previously present. And if you really paid very, very close attention to this map, you could actually figure out which one came first, which came second, which came third, and which came fourth, because nobody's gonna pitch their camp in the middle of trash. Therefore, the trash has to post date the campfire and the size of the rubbish tells you whether it is, what is, whether it is being deposited in a drop zone, a toss zone, or thrown directly into the fire. The, the, black, the black areas are uh, the ashy lenses and circles of firecrack rocks uh, from previous camps. Now let's shift from an above view to a side view. This is the side of a site from coastal Texas of the Native, a Native American people of coastal Texas that we'll meet eventually called the Karankoa. And Archaeological sites contain a mix of different depositional events. The mask site had four depositional events that were all the same thing. They're all caribou hunting camps. But most archaeological sites have a mixture of both things that were produced by humans and things that were produced by nature. And in the stratigraphic profile up above me, that's, that's sort of a cutaway side view of this site, uh, you can quite clearly see that we have the shaded area that with the vertical stripes, that's an oyster shell midden because the Native American peoples would come to the coast and they're gonna collect a lot of oysters, they're gonna do a lot of fishing, they're gonna do a little bit of duck hunting, and then they're gonna abandon their camp. And then nature is gonna take over. You might have a strong storm surge or even a hurricane, and it's gonna leave a deposit of tidal sand directly on top of their old camp. So you have the camp, that's one depositional event, a layer of tidal sand, that's a second depositional event. And if you can see, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, the Karankawa returned to this one camp and reused the same site. And again, left another layer of their camp, a midden of oyster shell, uh, directly on top of the tidal sand, forming a third depositional event. And you can quite clearly see, you know, in the, strat in the profile right up above me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like eight or nine depositional events right up there above me uh, showing the different human and different natural processes that have created the archeological record that was uncovered by these Texas archeologists along the coast. Now, this is a photograph of something very similar to the previous diagram, just to show you what this looks like uh, in real life. You can see the layers of the oyster middens. You can see the layer of the tidal sands and how people are returning to these camps over th thousands of years and reusing them as the Karankawa people kind of settled into this very interesting and sustainable relationship with the Texas environment. And in fact, we're going to have an entire lecture on nothing but the Karankawa seasonal round and how they were able to do so for thousands of years. And, you know, until something changed and their entire society collapsed.
because the thing is that the archaeological record is not static. The archaeological record is quite dynamic. It's always changing. It's just changing constantly at a time scale that is sometimes difficult for humans to perceive. Now, an archaeologist studied the sort of the dynamism of the archaeological record. His name is Michael Schiffer, and he wrote this very interesting book that you see right there. And it's got the most, it's got the sexiest title in the world, Formation Processes of the Archaeological Record. And he basically characterized the dynamism of the archaeological record into two broad categories that he calls N-transforms and C-transforms. N-transforms are the depositional events, are the transformations of the archaeological record created by nature. A C transform is a cultural transform. That is a depositional event or a transformation of the archaeological record created by people. So an N transform is nature changing the archaeological record. A C transform is culture changing the archaeological record. For instance, a mudslide, all right? Here's a mudslide in Alaska from the 1980s. I, don't, I think that car is gone, man. I think it's a write-off. At any rate, um, is this a C-transform or an N-transform? Uh, the answer is almost certainly this is an N-transform. The side of a hill was probably weakened by rain. It gave way, and it has buried this car, uh, probably a driveway, and a portion of this house with a thick layer of mud. Now, let's say this happened to our recreational campsite from Thousand Island Lake uh, in California, that we had, our, uh, we had our recreational campers in 1970, and let's say only a few years later, a mudslide buried the remains of that camp. And let's say more depositional events followed, and it's going to create a stratigraphic record that looks like that. That's what the archaeological record is going to look like that we have our original ground surface in 1970, we have our recreational campers from 1970, they set up a fire, they took pot shots at beer cans, and they littered all over the place. That's the remains of our leisure camp from 1970. And then let's say two years later, we had our mudslide that was that buried this site and created a new ground surface. And then there is another set of campers come in 1980 and pretty much do the same thing. It might even be the same people. They set up a leisure camp, a recreational camp, what they think is the same place, but what might in actuality be half a meter above their previous camp with this new land created um, by, the, uh, by the mudslide. So let's count these things. What are the transforms uh, of the archeological record? Well, the first was the camp from uh, 1970. That was, of course, a C transform. And this was followed by the mudslide, which is an N transform. And then that was followed by a second leisure camp in 1980. And that was another C transform. Now we're going to introduce a fourth depositional event that is, be, that is going to be created by these people right here. Who are these people? These people are... Well, it depends whether you like them or not. They're either recyclers or scavengers or looters or helping save the planet. It is up to you what you think they actually are. And uh, you can actually make, you shouldn't actually pity these people. A lot of people think that only like like homeless people who are reduced to this actually gather aluminum cans. This is, this is not true. I knew a guy in Dallas and he made a very decent living. Uh, he would get up at two in the morning and get him and his two kids and they would drive uh, up and down the back alleys around downtown and uptown Dallas and go through the dumpsters and get out all of these aluminum cans. And by about five in the morning, six in the morning, they're done. His kids go home to wash and go to school. He sorts and cleans the cans and then, you know, delivers them. Uh, and he made a, a pretty decent living. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a fabulous wealthy lifestyle, but he made a decent living working from about two in the morning to about noon, you know, scavenging, recycling aluminum cans. And that's what these people are doing. But the thing is, is that they didn't do this in the 1970s. Uh, they all, this, this sort of, this recycling of aluminum is something that started much later. So here's my question to you. Is this a C transform or an N transform? And hopefully the answer is quite simple. This is of course a C transform. People 
collecting aluminum for recycling is people transforming the archaeological record. Now, let's say one of these people came through our site in 1980 on the edge of Thousand uh, Island Lake, and it's going to change our archaeological uh, site. It's going to change our site. There we have the original ground surface. There's our leisure camp from 1970, the one that was buried in the 1972 landslide. There's our leisure camp from 1980, but note all of the aluminum cans are gone. Somebody came through and picked up all of those aluminum, aluminum beer cans. Now the shell casings might still be there. The bent tools might still be there. Uh, the hearth and the fire might still be there, but almost none of the cans are gonna be there. And let's say six years after that, uh, the lake itself had a big flood and deposited another layer of lake sediment on top of that camp from 1980. So it's created yet another and transform, that's nature transforming the archeological record in 1986. And there we have the archeological record. We have these different depositional events that are, being, that are changing through time. The leisure camp is a C transform, the mudslide and N transform. Our leisure camp in 1980 is another C transform. And then the lake sediment flooding in 1986, that is another N transform. These are each depositional events creating the archaeological record. And once you sort of unpack the archaeological record, then you can get it past human behavior. And especially with archaeology, you can look at how behavior changes over time. And in our hypothetical camps right here, we can see the difference between the camp in 1970 and the camp in 1980 as an increased concern for the environment and as an increased concern in recycling. As recycling becomes more more common and more widespread between 1970 and 1980. And now we have learned something, hypothetically, about, the, about our somewhat ancient past. Uh, and this is how archaeology works. We, have now, we are now generating knowledge about the past. We can do it in modern day California. We can do it in ancient Egypt. We can even do it in coastal Texas. Here again, let's return to the Karankua. And I want you to look at these. Which are C transforms and which are N transforms? There we have the original uh, beach. That's tidal sand. That's an N transform. Then we have the dark hatched layer of the oyster mitten left from when the uh, Karankoa camped here over a period of time. That's going to be a C transform. And then they abandon their camp. Uh, then we have another layer of tidal sand. That's an N transform. Then there's a second layer of oyster middens a C transform. Then there's a rather thinnish layer of more tidal sand. That's another N transform. And then a very thick layer of, uh, uh, of an oyster midden, uh, another C transform. Now, the thickness of the middens probably doesn't have anything to do with like how long they stayed. But what, what, what we're doing with this one cut through the, the sand is we're probably clipping the edges or being in the center of camps. Uh, so it might it might actually be a like a spatial orientation and have nothing to do with duration. But at any rate, these are all differences in C transforms and N transforms as both humans and nature alter the archaeological record. And so the goal of archaeology is to take the archaeological record and untangle all of these different depositional events in, in an attempt to reconstruct the past. And each of these past processes add up to the archaeological record, and together they can tell you something about past human behavior. And at the end, you build a hypothesis to determine something about past human behavior, and then see if the archaeological record upholds, falsifies, or modifies your original hypothesis. And all of this is to underscore the fact that the archaeological record is dynamic. It changes over time. You don't have this kind of false idea that the archaeological record represents human behavior sort of frozen in space. Like our recreational campers from 1970 just suddenly said, oh my gosh, we have to leave, and they dropped everything and ran away. The archaeological record is never a perfect reflection of past human behavior, but it's always an imperfect reflection through the rubbish, through the material that's left behind. And that false idea, that false idea that the archaeological record directly reflects ancient events is called the Pompeii, the Pompeii premise. 
named after the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. And we're actually going to study Pompeii. But basically, this is the definition of the Pompeii premise. The Pompeii premise is the false idea that the archaeological record directly represents past human behavior. It does not. The archaeological record imperfectly reflects past human behavior over time. The archaeological record is never set of events and behaviors frozen in time. Now, with our knowledge of how sites form, with our knowledge of how to read the archaeological record, we're going to actually look at how sites form. We're going to look at how several cities have died over time. We're going to talk about Pompeii itself in a few modules. But before we get to the dead cities of the dead city of Pompeii, we're going to talk about cities that are right now turning into the archaeological record. We're going to talk about abandoned radioactive communist cities. But that is for the next module, and I will see you there.